Amazon Prime superhero series The Boys, particularly its most recent season 3, is one of the most controversial mainstream TV series being released right now. Yet what's most interesting is what the show is controversial for. Despite having some of the most vivid and visceral depictions of both violence and sex, even mixing the two, which you always know I certainly like. Did I just reveal my kink? I think I might have just revealed my kink. Anyways, moving on, those elements have for the most part been taken as is, despite them being one of the most likely things to have a series get people into a moral panic over. Really have I never. I mean, this season alone had a not at all shy scene, exploding heads, and a dude literally <laughs> exploding inside of him when he sneezed. So, yeah, the show is definitely my kink. You laser my fucking tits. No, what the show has garnered controversy over is its progressive politics. The fact that it's gone <gasps> woke. Oh my. The infusion of left politics ruins it all for me. The first infusion of left politics. It starts to feel like a Disney musical. It felt way off if compare it to season one. That was awesome. I'll give it a few episodes before it crashed like the rest. Leftists ruin everything they touch. Most uninspiring propaganda mess I've ever seen. The ham-fisted political stuff is just awful. There is no political pandering in the comic. These people creating the show ham-fisted their political beliefs into this show with zero nuance. It's always at the stake of good storytelling. This was the worst episode yet. Borderline unwatchable. We get it, you despise half your audience and have to straw man their beliefs into your show because you're more ideological than a Puritan. Keep the woke nonsense out of things that were never made for it. Just watch The Boys Season 3. It's basically woke garbage trash. That had enough violence and brutal awesome scenes that I could be entertained for the most part. People were shocked, I mean positively shocked, to find out that Homelander was the villain. You know, the series Superman equivalent, who wraps himself in an American flag, often stands in as a satirization of American nationalism and how it uses individualism and self-anxiety, and who last season had zero qualms about fucking a literal 1940s Nazi as she aggrandized his power and tried to use him to reignite her white supremacist rhetoric in the United States by playing to his overgrown but sensitive ego. <laughs> Yeah, how could that guy be the villain? Jokes aside though, season three, more than prior, seemed to garner backlash from many conservative and right-wing spaces who saw the show directly tackling issues like cancel culture and referencing movements like Black Lives Matter in a way that felt more didactically partisan than previous years. Yet the show has never been exactly subtle with its theming, even in previous seasons with it tackling rampant corporatism, American imperialism, the politics of Christian nationalism, and the aforementioned white supremacy. And then they just started letting all kinds of people in, you know? I don't know. So why don't you tell me? Well, I think you do know. Some people are quality and others are... garbage. So why has this season of all seasons sparked the anti-woke crowd to react vitriolically? Or, to better ask the question, why were they drawn to the series and to venerate characters like Homelander in the first place, without realizing that the series was criticizing the things these characters represent, and what changed this year? And at the same time, coming at the show from a more leftist perspective that I have, how is the show even possible to be read as one of the most progressive mainstream series of all time on TV today, when its message would seem to be at direct odds with its real life production? While the show seemingly attacks rampant capitalism and the systems of nationalism, patriarchal power, and disenfranchisement within our current political system today, and the anxiety at our unique place within all of that that it causes, it also is literally funded by Amazon, one of the most, if not the most, capitalist companies ever to exist. How can the boys be one of the most progressive mainstream TV series and yet also sit at this complex fulcrum of tension with itself, at once seemingly misinterpreted by those on the right who resonate with the surface level depiction of power showcased by characters like Homelander, and yet seemingly hypocritically be critical of the very system which allows it to exist? And even beyond that, many people would argue that the show is just like South Park, taking the piss out of the left and right equally, not just going after the right, which made it okay that this was going after the right wing because the leftists got it too in this show, when I actually don't think that that is the case at all. You know, the boys showrunner, Eric Kripke, claims that the white dude standing next to you 
are the most dangerous people. I would say that that is definitely cause for concern. You'd have to be an idiot not to think so. But I also think that, you know, there are elements that point to it quite literally uh, poking fun at everyone. And why is it one of my favorite TV shows of all time? And I just, <laughs> hey, gotta love it. It's always tasty. But anyways, and why is it one of my favorite TV shows of all time? And I swear it's not just because my Star Trek boys, Jack Quaid and Carl Urban are in it. Though God, Boimler and McCoy, I would love to see that Lower Decks episode. So to understand why conservatives misunderstand the boys' political message, it's best to start with what, or more specifically, who, drew them to the series in the first place, Homelander. This shows there's... This just shows... I like seeing how this demented, hardline villain foils the inept, bumbling morons the show keeps telling us are the good guys. It's refreshing to see an antagonist strong enough to carry a series. His viewpoint is an incredibly interesting one to break down. What makes him see the protagonists of the show as weak and bumbling, and what draws him to Homelander as a character? Is it simply just the fact that we enjoy watching a good villain on screen, or is there something deeper at work here? Which begs the question, what is the appeal of Homelander to certain people? Homelander is a stand-in for Superman, the white straight male leader of a superhero team who has almost no limits on his power and stands for values of truth, justice, and most importantly, the American way. Boys, okay. Can I, can I get a selfie? Of course you can. On the surface, Homelander embodies all the ideals we're seemingly supposed to revere in the United States. The strong masculine hero out to protect. An individual who can rise to power as the head of a team based on his physical and mental merits alone, seemingly given to him by his biology, by God, by how hard he worked to earn it. Many right-wingers were drawn to Homelander because he is ultimately representative of what America chooses to say is worth cultivating, an intense individualistic usage of power, but one which wraps itself in a cloak of being a strong American protector, that we are morally right and can enact our will upon the world. This is everything that characters like Superman or Captain America have represented since they were created at least on a surface level, these symbolic representations of American power. Now, there are certainly a lot more nuance to a lot of those characters, like Superman being a literal immigrant created by Jewish creators, but on the surface, that's why a lot of right-wing people are drawn to these types of characters. Yet, unlike Superman and Captain America, Homelander starts to uncover a lot of the underlying problems with this American idealism. Homelander, in the initial seasons, was also a stand-in for American nationalism and imperialism. He's draped in the American flag and loves to spout love for his country, yet he also enacts similar powers America does around the world. In season one, for example, we learn that he secretly gave Compound V, this drug that gives people superpowers, to terrorists in the Middle East in order to justify his desire to go into those countries and act like the world police, even trying to get the United States government and himself blanket opportunity to enter these countries with permission. Well some compound V. I had a train run it all over the globe and I supercharged some jihadis. <laughs> I, not to oversimplify it, I mean, it, it was actually very difficult and very messy using adult subjects. Uh, there's a good reason that Bod doesn't do it, but well, enough survived to call the operation a huge success. Huge. And now, we have villains all over the globe that only we can fight. In sequel after sequel after sequel. And all of this mirrors United States colonial history, and most specifically post-9-11 United States, justification of the intervention in the Middle East in order to hold a sphere of influence and use the resources in the area, despite the fact that a lot of that area's destabilization was caused by the United States in the first place. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. These carefully targeted actions are designed to disrupt the use of Afghanistan as a terrorist base of operations and to attack the military capability of the Taliban regime. 
Yet, Homelander standing in for American nationalism, imperialism, and exceptionalism is made even more evident in Season 3, as we learn that Homelander is also the child of Soldier Boy. This former American Golden Boy supposedly fought in World War II against the Nazis and into Vietnam. Soldier Boy, with his American shield and his ties to World War II, represents a sort of Captain America-style superhero. The good old days when America could go into the world and punch Nazis because we knew it was the simple, right thing to do. At least that's how our nostalgia likes to think of those days when we talk about America, and you see that in some of the old propaganda footage of Soldier Boy from the time. He defended us against the encroaching Red Menace. Congress, I have a list right here of avowed communists. He helped guide America into a brighter future. So Homelander is literally the child of American history of moral righteousness that draws many right-wingers to this sort of nostalgic view of American nationalist identity in belief in American exceptionalism. That American power is morally correct, and that individuals today who enact power in America's name are still carrying that torch with moral certitude. Yet right-wingers' veneration and love of Homelander's surface-level American nationalistic appeal misses how the show actively criticizes Homelander. Unlike Superman, who at least earnestly embodies these beliefs, Homelander's idealistic exterior is only shown as a facade. From season one, we learn that Homelander doesn't care about protecting others. It's not his primary motivation. His main motivation is attention, his stroking of his ego. Throughout the series, Homelander isn't worried about protecting others, but constantly worries about his image, his approval ratings, and how people view him, and if they like or love him. Wait. What do you mean I'm up? 21 points with your base. What did you just say to me? 21 points. They loved your speech. A massive 44% uptake with white males in the Rust Belt. Oh, yes. I know. Fuck yes. 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 You're saying you're confident and unapologetic and that you know, you're not afraid to... <sighs> Keep fucking going, Ashley. Don't stop. Um. He likes and honestly needs the power that comes not just from the fact that he can topple buildings, but the attention he gets from enacting that power in the world. He's all about appearances, and throughout the first two seasons, we see that he believes that he gets that positive attention by giving the impression of being a protector. Listening to us haggling over nickels. We're the seven, for God's sake. Whether we're out there or we're in here. Now, what I do want to hear is who you saved this week. Huh? Who's up for that? <laughs> In Season 1, when terrorists take over a flight, Homelander attempts to stop the hijacking. However, when he accidentally kills the pilot and damages the plane, he realizes that he's not going to be able to save all the civilians, which honestly doesn't concern him at all. There's nothing to stand on. It's fucking air. I don't know. Fly at it. Ram it straight. I don't know that kind of speed. Either the plane goes ass over tit, or I'll punch straight through the hull. <laughs> <laughs> One by one, you fly him to the ground. <laughs> Come back 123 times? Maeve, think. We're done here. His biggest worry is how this will appear to the world. And in the end, he abandons the flight and everyone on it to die. This stands in direct comparison to the Golden Age, more earnest version of Superman, who is famous for saving falling planes from crashing into the Earth. It's like his favorite thing to do. Yet Homelander, he doesn't want to be seen as a failure, and instead uses it as an opportunity to appear strong in the face of tragedy, even literally using a speech that mirrors one given by former Republican President George W. Bush. Together, we will make sure that this never happens to our great nation ever again. God bless you. God bless America. We hear you, Homelander. And I hear you, brother. I hear you, and the world hears you. And very, very soon, my friend, whoever did this to us will hear from all of us. Thousands of our citizens. I can hear you.
we'll hear all of us soon. whose administration was similarly warned of a horrific terrorist hijacking with 9-11, but did nothing to stop it. Yet still used the tragedy to not only boost his approval ratings by appearing to be a robust and confident president in the aftermath of the disaster, but also to push his power with things like the Patriot Act, which were passed through Congress almost immediately after 9-11 happened. It's more important to him that he gives the appearance of a good guy, because that's what he believes is required to get positive attention and allows him to enact more power just like the United States presidents have. We can even look at how the show breaks down the nostalgic view of America through the character of Soldier Boy, who is also a facade. We learn that he never actually stormed Normandy, nor fought in Vietnam. Soldier Boy was a hero, right? I mean, he stormed Normandy. <laughs> yeah, he did. Two weeks after D-Day for the photo op. So he didn't see any action? Not in Germany. He sprayed a fire hose at Birmingham. Some target practice at Kent State. <sighs> There were rumors about Daly Plaza. Wait, what? Yeah, and they call them the good old days. The thing is, to be American means knowing you're the hero. So what do we do? We sweep all our filthy shit under the rug, and we tell ourselves a myth, like Soldier Boy, and I get stinking rich selling it. He just was flown out there to give the appearance of a strong, masculine American hero. In reality, he is a misogynistic, drug-addicted asshole with PTSD. His mouth must feel like a Hoover Deluxe. God, every single thing you say is so gross. He saved me, okay? More than once. So I owe him. Oh, bullshit. You're on a mission. You get the job done, okay? I stormed Normandy. I fought the Nazis. You want to know what I do when I'm sad or scared? Fucking nothing. Because I'm not a fucking pussy. You didn't storm shit. Like Homelander after him, America used Soldier Boy as a photo op, dragging him around to give America the veneer of being a strong protector, so it could then justify its continued growing sphere of influence around the world. Yet, at the end of the day, Soldier Boy did still at least ultimately wish to fight Nazis and, despite being a horrid human being, was not easily controlled by corporations like Vought. And so around the mid-20th century within the history of the show, at the same time Reagan-era economic policies began to deregulate capitalism and give more power to corporate America, Soldier Boy was cast aside for Homelander. But this is where we have to be very, very careful because Homelander is not simply an American stand-in because he's not representative of the system, but an individual product of that system. Like, quite literally, he's a product. We learn that the company Vaught grew him in a lab as a small child and raised him to be their star brand, the head of their superhero team to sell themselves to America. We even learn that all superheroes are quite literally products of Vought, with Vought having created the superheroes by secretly giving children V around the world. Literally, the idea of influential individuals being able to enact their will and power around the world is the result of this world's rampant capitalist impulses. The idea of the strong individual who can just do whatever they want based on their biology of the strength of their own power is quite literally a capitalist product. So, while Homelander represents the system, he's also somewhat a victim of it. Because, as a result of not having an actual father figure growing up, he has a profoundly crippling anxiety stemming from his ego and his need to be light. Say it! Want them to love me. Yahtzee! Only it never seems to work out, does it? Madeline, Maeve, Stormfront, even your own son. So why do you keep running headfirst into the same brick wall. I don't know. Pants on fire, you know. It's because deep down there's a part of you that is still human. No. Uh, part of you is. A dirty, shriveled, anemic little part of you that still mules for approval and love and a mommy and a daddy and a oh, boo-hoo-hoo. -hoo. 
He even fucks a shape-shifting version of himself in season two because he has so much wrapped up in his ego that he can't even see beyond his own need to love himself. All of his anxieties are informed by the lack of a father figure in his life, a lack of someone to show him how to enact masculinity in a healthy and positive way. And so he desperately seeks approval from all of those around him in the only way that he knows how to, by enacting the toxic masculine version of a man that he's been told to by all of society around him. This product of capitalist ideas, this sort of strong individual man who just willy-nilly enacts his power in the name of American idealism. He even understands this consciously, linking his lack of a father figure in season three by trying to earn his father Soldier Boy's approval by the end of that season. But with you and I together, they wouldn't stand a chance. Nobody would. Unless we kill each other first. He ain't your kid. Yes, I am. I am your son. I am your blood. That's all that matters. Maybe. And this is why many right-wing conservatives, especially young men, still venerated Homelanders despite his horrific actions. Because they see him as themselves. A person feeling deeply anxious due to the victimization he felt having been created and used by the system around them. Left feeling empty and nihilistic and told that they were supposed to be strong male heroes, but given no real direction or to go in. They were only told to shop, to buy, to make things, to enact anger and will upon the world, but don't really have anything to put that toward. As we work with Congress in the coming year to chart a new course in Iraq and strengthen our military to meet the challenges of the 21st century, we must also work together to achieve important goals for the American people here at home. This work begins with keeping our economy growing. And I encourage you all to go shopping more. Not until the terrorists are captured. Please. America is safe, okay? It is safe. So, everyone. Get out there, go to your restaurants, and uh, go to your movie theaters, and, and live your lives. Have fun, okay? No project, no greater sense of something to do with this power and energy other than to just push it upon the world. They just wanted Homelander to be revealed to be misunderstood because that's how they felt. That he could still be the hero. And this is why season three left them feeling cold, because the show made clear that Homelander won't change. He's a product of a system tailor-made to create him, and one which never stops rewarding him for indulging in his worst nature. He's not going to change because he's never given an opportunity to actually need to change. Look at me, Tiger. Look at me. We gotta cut that part of you out like a cancer. And then? Well then, my boy, you can finally be who you were always meant to be. Pure, clean, like marble. The only thing that he was awarded for was not the values that he stood for, but the power he wielded. It ultimately comes back to America's veneration of power. In season three, Homelander becomes increasingly unhinged due to his realization that Bot continues to try to enact its power over him. What a surprise! Our testing shows that 76% of likely viewers will make every effort to watch tonight for Starlight. As for you, 53% might DVR. I think that that means that she can call her own shots, don't you? So how about I just walk, Stan? How would that rate? After the PR hole you dug for yourself this past year, I'd say you're lucky we're putting on this farce at all. But hey, it's your party. You can cry if you want to. And yet he realizes that he doesn't need to play that game. Because they draped him in the ideals of America, he has become an individualistic symbol of America in the world of the show. It's not him that stands up for American ideals. Anything that he does becomes American because America has equated so much with individualism. Hey, good to see you. I love you guys. You are America. True patriots. As a result, The Boys makes it clear that Homelander is a stand-in for political ideologues like Trump, who equate themselves with national identity. He is America, and America is him. Thus, Homelander is the ultimate end product of America's hyper-capitalism, a nationalistic individual identity that seeks power for its own sake. And we see all the things that we're dealing with today that are a result of all of this in Homelander. Homelander wields cancel culture narratives to say that he's speaking truth to the system. All my life, people have tried to control me. My whole life, rich people, 
powerful people tried to muzzle me, cancel me, keep me impotent and, and obedient like I'm a fucking puppet. You know what? It worked. Because I allowed it to work. And guess what? If they can control me, then you can... Bet your ass they can control you. They already do. You just don't realize it. I'm done. I am done apologizing. I am done being persecuted for my strength. You people should be thanking Christ that I am who and what I am because you need me. You need me to save you. That he'll drain the swamp as it were. Yeah, well, I am riled up. I am. I am sick and tired of the lies peddled by the mainstream media. But the real question here, Cam, who's behind these attacks? Who is trying to silence me? Maybe the rich and powerful forces you mentioned in your, I thought, courageous speech. Thank you. Who are they? Well, look, for the most part, they're people you've never heard of, but they operate in the shadows, and they are the ones pulling the strings. And unfortunately, they're everywhere, even inside of Vaught. That those in power don't really want you to hear what he has to say. They don't care what you think. They want to control your mind. They want you to do what you're told. They, they want, want you to kiss the ring. They're not sentimental. They, they want, want the power. power. They, they want, want power. power. They, they hate you. you. They want to hurt you. They, they call you a racist. They, they call, call you racist. racist. They want to control what you do. And of course, they want to control your children, too. And they want you to know it. They couldn't be clearer about that. Again, showing how cancel culture narratives are often used by the right wing in order to prop up their own power. No one's actually being canceled, they're just using it in order to gain more power. Within the show, this results in Homelander being given control of Bot, and he's seen as fighting those liberals in the government and in Bot. He also spreads lies against those who speak against him, like Starlight, saying that she runs a child sex trafficking ring, echoing real-life conspiracy theories like Pizzagate and QAnon that vilified figures like Hillary Clinton and marginalized groups as child groomers. So, I guess you've all heard about Starlight's alleged Involvement with the human trafficking ring? Mm hmm Yeah. And I suppose it's pure coincidence that uh, she opened the Starlight House for runaway teens? Huh? Come on, we can put two and two together, can't we? Homelander creates an alternate reality for his followers, placing him as the underdog fighting for the truth. He's a fucking psychopath. Worse than Starlight. She's trafficking kids. The same age as Janine, as the, as the kids in my classroom. Homelander is the only one protecting them. Okay, you guys, that's enough. Homelander ain't protecting shit, all right? He's feeding you this insane fairy tale and you're too fucking stupid and, and brainwashed to fucking see it. Hey, fuck you. But at the end of the season, even that facade is removed as he murders a man in cold blood for protesting him. And he gets cheered for it. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> It's because Homelander miscalculated before. It wasn't that he was valued for being a strong protector. All that is valued by this system is utilizing masculine power. The show here is very much drawing heavily from the Zack Snyderification of heroes like Superman in movies like Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, and the Snyder Cut. While Superman of the comics would go out of his way to care and protect others, in his films, Snyder strips Superman of any active need to save civilians or care about others. In the end of Man of Steel, Superman literally destroys Metropolis with millions dead and the movie pays it no mind. Instead, the only thing the movie cares about is Superman's power, which it often equates to America and Jesus and his God-given strength. The only question the movie cares about is should Superman feel limited or freed by how people will judge him for using his power? And the answer is, he should just use it as he sees fit. It's a veneration of masculine power. We see this clearly in Batman v Superman, when instead of having an ideological difference between the two characters, Batman and Superman are just slightly different versions of angry men who get to punch each other. And we're supposed to get enjoyment simply out of the fact that two men are using their strength to pound each other into the dirt. Yeah, I love testosterone! Even in the film, the American government, which is literally spending the entire movie trying to curb Superman's usage of individualistic power in the Middle East in the same way that Homelander does in season one of the boys, is blown up, destroyed, with Superman looking at its sad remains, not even bothering to save anybody. As if to say that any attempt to try to regulate the power of the strong, individualistic American hero was ultimately self-defeating. The boys even makes clear that even when this sort of veneration of heroes comes from an earnest place, that it still can be wielded towards these ends. Marvel movies like Captain America seem to at least understand the joy at the kindness at the heart of characters like Steve Rogers, and I love Rogers so, so much. He's one of my favorite characters. That's because Rogers embodies not the nationalistic identity of America, but instead the values that the symbol of America is supposed to represent through his personhood, his kindness, his caring, his love of diversity. This is why you were chosen. 
Because a strong man who has known power all his life may lose respect for that power. But a weak man knows the value of strength and knows compassion. Yet even he can be stripped of those markers for simple surface level appeal just as characters like Soldier Boy are. This is something that the MCU itself tried to address in the TV show Falcon and the Winter Soldier, but ultimately failed to do well because it ended with Sam Wilson, the new Captain America, just telling the senators who were the ones causing the problem in the first place to just do better. The only power I have is that I believe we can do better. We can't demand that people step up and we don't meet them halfway. You control the banks. Shit, you can move borders. You can knock down a forest with the email. You can feed a million people with the phone call. You've got to do better, Senator. You've got to step up. Because if you don't, the next Carly will. And you don't want to see 2.0. People believed in her cause so much that they helped her defy the strongest governments in the world. Instead of recognizing that they have no incentive to change the system, telling them to do better isn't going to make them do better. And so at the end of the day, the MCU just ended up reaffirming the same system, ultimately trying to argue that the symbolism of America, what America is supposed to represent, is enough to sway the day without recognizing it's ultimately not going to change anything because these people in power have no incentive to change. And this is the most radical that a movie made by Disney is going to get, and even this one was shoved into a TV show on Disney+, Plus rather than it being one of the MCU movies proper, which would reach the most amount of people. Even the most radical vision of the show, which had to be hidden away, is not about changing or bucking the system, but just reaffirming it as it is. This Snyderification is parried throughout the boys in subtle ways. <laughs> and explicit ways, as throughout the show we see these seven participate in a movie that directly parodies Zack Snyder's Justice League, even referencing a similar controversy surrounding Joss Whedon coming in to direct the picture. Yeah, this new Joss rewrite really sings, huh? Right, well, after the, you know, Stormfront's a Nazi thing, we had real talks about shelving the movie, or at least dumping it on Vault Plus, but the, the fans spoke with those release the board cut hashtags, you guys, I love you. It points out how this stripping away of our veneer of love of the earnest kindness from our veneration of superheroes like Superman is not an individualistic choice of Snyder, but ultimately the end product of capitalistic mass market consumption of symbolism. Since we're talking about products from Warner Brothers, think about how stuff like their Lego movie or their recent multiverses game, which just shoved together a bunch of random IP they own, remove these characters and stories from their context. So that you'll get a cartoony version of Arya Stark, a girl who is literally from a show full of rape, incest, endless violence, and more, next to Shaggy. These characters are completely removed from the context of their original stories and work to just shallowly present themselves to you in order to sell a product for Warner Brothers. As corporations keep trying to make products that strip away deeper meaning in order to just continue surface level appeal, these characters lose their actual meaning and just are left with what's on the outside. And what's on the outside is just a love of power and nationalistic identity that these characters come pre-wrapped in. The rippling padded muscles and the red, white, and blue. When you take away everything meaningful from these characters, all that's left is a fascistic veneration of power. This is how right-wing folks ultimately misinterpret characters like both Superman and Homelander because they aren't given any tools to actually analyze media because the media that they ultimately consume has no deeper meaning. It's all just service level Zack Snyder, look at my rippling muscles and look, he's kind of like Jesus. I mean, just take a look at the fact that Snyder Bros adore this shot right here. It's the most obvious on the nose shot that you could ever make in a movie and yet it's seen as so deep and symbolic when it's literally all just on the surface. Because this very obvious image is the deepest they're able to read media like this. This is the end result of what our media does today. Strip away any actual deeper meaning but give the veneer of it in order to make people think that they're getting something deeper than they actually are but leaving them still filled with anxiety. These people say they want the kindness the characters stand for but ultimately they just want the Zack Snyder version of male veneration. 
The boys even showed how this happens in the real world by being actually really prescient, because it seemed to presage the recent controversy around Zack Snyder seemingly helping to manufacture the Snyder Cut movement in order to get that movie made. Uh, Tony Gilroy had to uh, reach you uh, your uh, shit! I know a fraud, babe, I'm a fraud! Oh, oh, pull my hair! This emasculated stand-in for Snyder within the boys shows that all this masculine posturing ultimately underscores a deep internal anxiety of self and manliness, and a need to reassert it through shows of symbolic masculine dominance, of power. It's why fascism is so fascinated by aesthetics of power over just power, because it's all about the aesthetics. It's only aesthetics. It's all about just looking cool. That's why it's important to punch Nazis, because once Nazis are punched, they look weak, because they are. It exposes the reality that's just beneath the thin surface. The Boys uses this in-world Snyder film as well as Homelander to show how this veneration of power is packaged in corporate products like this. Ultimately, in corporations like Disney or Warner Brothers' pursuit in making the most mass market product available, a product, not art, made to be consumable by as many people as possible, they strip away any underlying themes and meaning from a work. All that's left on the surface is a veneration of fascistic masculine power. See this in other ways the right wing misinterpreted the show. There is a storyline in season 3 featuring a critique of how police often overpolice black neighborhoods and justify extra violence against black men. This storyline features Blue Hawk, a soup who represents police brutality, having killed a black man by bashing in his head for mugging a white woman. Despite the show going on to use this storyline to showcase A-Train's need to not just symbolically steal cultural symbols of the black community for his own self-importance and brand, as well as how men like Blue Hawk refuse to acknowledge their actions as harmful, a topic that I'll get more into in my next video I'm doing on the boys, the right actually ended up defending Blue Hawk, even causing a controversy in the boys subreddit, saying Hawk was making good points until the show suddenly turned on him. We're seeing a white soup called Blue Hawk who patrols a black neighborhood as a cartoon villain. Oh, forget that he stopped a savage mugging. There is a victim here. Oh, because we're supposed to believe the black witnesses instead. He oh, it's the racist right deferring blame on innocent Antifa. We're not going to get the suddenly Afrocentric A-Train confronting Blue Hawk and realizing he was in the right to take the fight to the hood. We're not going to see black on black crime thwarted by a white hero. That would actually be bold. Here, this person argued that Blue Hawk was right to literally murder a black man. It ignores that even if there was a victim of a mugging here, the man didn't deserve to die, nor gruesomely murdered in the street. But this is how many police treat black men no matter the situation, and how the right almost always justifies extra use of power, especially on black men, after the fact always trying to find ways to justify that a black person deserved to die. Places like Fox have done a good job of threading this needle that's like, oh my God, those violent people, and because they're so violent, the police just have to be violent in response. And that's actually the idea that undergirds the stories that people like Candace Owens tell. So part of our responsibility is to challenge that and make them explain that a little bit more, and then to attack the underlying idea. The underlying idea is that those that those communities are just inherently dangerous, that therefore require the presence of the police, that lead to the violence of the police. And how this YouTuber argued that it was about black on black crime, when even the show had it be a white woman as the victim, showcasing how defense of the vulnerable white woman is often used to justify violence against black people. Again, it's all just veneration of masculine power for power's sake, here taken into the realm of policing, and how people misinterpreted this storyline within the show. The show isn't about saying Trump bad. It's about expressing that the system that makes Trump would always make a Trump. It's the system that produces him that's bad. All that is valued by this system is utilizing masculine power, specifically white male power. This is made very explicit in season two, where we meet the character of Stormfront. She's given the name of a literal white supremacist site in the real world, so the show is, again, not exactly being subtle. But she's also an actual Nazi. Like she worked for Hitler, but then came to America after World War II and became a straightforward white supremacist superhero? Hey, your car was involved in a robbery tonight. No, it wasn't. I, I had it. I don't know nothing about any robbery. Just confess. <laughs> Why are you doing this to me, lady? Ain't you supposed to be a hero? I am a hero for killing a black piece of shit like you. <laughs> highlighting the very real link between Nazism and white supremacist history in the United States. Despite having fought World War II against Germany, there was a growing Nazi movement in the United States at the time that grew out of the United States' own white supremacist history. Hitler himself often venerated America's white supremacist history. 
and all of that never went away, but just changed faces. Renegade Cut did a great video on this history, by the way, so if you want to know more about it, I'd go recommend checking out his video. But we see this today with many white supremacist groups like the Proud Boys, and basically what the GOP now is. But within the world of the show, it morphed into who Stormfront is, who morphs herself into this TikTok-friendly version of a white supremacist superhero. W's like Victoria Newman want us to do. Just let him in and give him a cup of iced tea. <laughs> and then punish us for trying to stop them. That's right. Has there ever been anyone in history more persecuted just for trying to protect their own? And gets a seat on the superhero team and begins to be drawn to Homelander. Just as white supremacist groups and rhetoric in the real world got more and more corporate legitimacy and began to revere people like Trump. Homelander is drawn to Stormfront's stroking of his ego, even fucking her because he likes the attention that she gives him and her love of his power. Mm -hmm. It really speaks to the deterioration of good, God-fearing American values. Kill me! Oh, what's this world coming to? <laughs> This is also reflected in the fact that a lot of the hashtag Restore the Snyderverse proponents were those same thinly veiled white supremacist anti-SJW talking heads that were represented by the anti-SJWness of Stormfront. And you can hear the same way that they talk about him is the same way that Homelander talks about himself, connecting him as fighting back against this nebulous Hollywood elite, just like Homelander says he's fighting back against this nebulous, mysterious group within Vought, just as Tucker Carlson talks about how there's this nebulous this ruling class that's out to get you. This is Ryan with Dark Hay Outpost and GeeksandGamers.com, and Zack Snyder loves his fans, which is one of the things that makes him so much different than the typical people in the Hollywood elites and the media that support them. And that is why so many people have tried to stop Zack Snyder from making his movie. I am sick and tired of the lies peddled by the mainstream media. But the real question here, Cam, who's behind these attacks? Who is trying to silence me? Maybe the rich and powerful forces you mentioned in your, I thought, courageous speech. Thank you. They, they want, want the power. power. They, they want, want power. power. They, they hate you. you. They want to hurt you. They, they call you a racist. They, they call, call you, you racist. racist. They want to control what you do. And of course, they want to control your children too. And they want you to know it. They couldn't be clearer about that. To be clear, this isn't me saying everyone that likes the Snyderverse movies or wants to see the Snyderverse brought back is a secret Nazi. I myself don't like those movies and don't really want them to continue, but I am endlessly fascinated by them and Snyder's work. So please save your comments of me having said I called you a fascist for liking Batman v Superman. It's okay to enjoy his films. But it's also important, and probably even more important if you do enjoy his films, to call out the horrid people that constantly venerate him. You know outside of the endless bots that are made to venerate him. And if you want a really good analysis of all of Zack Snyder's films, I'd recommend Maggie Mae Fish's wonderful series on the man. But going back to Homelander though, he is initially uncomfortable with Stormfront's Nazi rhetoric. But not enough to condemn it. He's just mildly uncomfortable with it. Oh, they will. When you lead an army of Aryan Ubermensch to their victory. What? No. No. Yes. No, no, how many times do I have to tell you we don't need a fucking master race? I'm the master race, that's the point. That is, until the end of season three, when he has fully embraced her supporters as his own, fully accepting the mantle of a white supremacist superhero and not really ashamed of it. And all this shows us who Homelander really is. Yes, we can understand where he comes from. He is ultimately a fragile, weak, ego-driven man who is constantly filled with anxiety that he isn't enough. He needs to be liked and loved because he's worried he won't be seen as man enough, as strong enough. He doesn't know where to put this drive of this masculine strength anger that he's told to enact upon the world. And this is where many men in our society have been left feeling, without guidance or a sense that they are doing anything worthwhile. Left in a corporate America that has told them they are powerful and told that they are great because they are white, and then after all that told only to consume, to buy. And so they ultimately turn to white supremacy, because it's a system that justifies their belief in their superiority, one that's baked into the history of America. Homelander is the result of a system that was tailor-made to create him. Homelander is not misunderstood. He's perfectly understood. He's the villain. And he will never change because he never had the chance to be anything else. And that's 
what's sad and terrifying about him. Alrighty, so as you may have noticed, this video is basically over. Yet I only addressed the first question from the top of this video. How did right-wingers misinterpret Homelander? Yet we didn't dive into how, despite that, people still see a tension in the boy's message. Some argue, for example, that the show is like South Park, that while it's certainly going after the right wing, it also takes the piss out of the left equally, which is a viewpoint that I heavily disagree with. And I also didn't address how that if this show is so anti-corporate, how is it made by Amazon and how do we reconcile that fact? But most importantly to me, I didn't answer the biggest unanswered question. If Homelander is the end product of all we've been talking about, if this system was tailor-made to create him and we have to fight back against people like him because they aren't incentivized to change, is there any way out? Is the show just a nihilistic look at and a vilification of the radicalization of men? And I think the answer is no, because the show offers us a glimmer of hope in the form of several characters but most notably, the imperfect yet ultimately positive character of Huey. We save everyone, even if they don't deserve it, especially if they don't deserve it. But unfortunately, I originally had that in this video, but like Homelander's ego, it grew a little bit too big. So I'm actually gonna be splitting this video into two parts, and the second part is coming next week where we will continue this analysis. So be ready for that. But until then, I am actually going to give you the outro that I originally recorded when I thought this was one video. So here you go. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and I love you all. Hello everybody, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this video. I just wanted to make it because I wanted to rant about the boys for a while and I was very frustrated with so many people misinterpreting the message of the show. But I'm gonna wrap it out there. One thing I will say, if you wanna hear me talk more about the boys, I actually was very lucky enough to talk to Jack Quaid, Huey himself, for an hour and a half. And while we talk about a bunch of things like Star Trek Lower Decks and video games, and he's a really cool dude, honestly, we did talk a lot about the boys and the filming of episodes like Hero Gasm. So if you wanna hear more about that, check out that video, Jack Quaid, Absolutely wonderful human being. I adore him to death. He was absolutely wonderful to talk to. That's what I do here on this channel. I talk about LGBTQ and social and political issues through nerddoms and geekdoms and pop culture right here on this channel. I also, if you want to support me doing what I do, I have a Patreon that helps me, uh, you know, pay the bills and all that stuff because this is my full-time job. I also have a podcast called Jumpgate where I rewatch every episode of the wonderful show Babylon 5 with my friend Vera Wild. I am also on Twitter. I am also on Nebula. But beyond all of that, I just thank you so much for being here. I hope you're all taking care of yourself and I hope that you, as always, live long and prosper. Hello there, patrons. Thank you all so much for supporting me. I could not do this. I could not pay my bills. I could not live. I could not be a weird, nerdy dork for you on camera without all of your support. So mwah, thank you to all of you. I appreciate all of you. And with that said, an extra special thank you to Catherine and Beth, Karee Elrin Frost, Joe Herman Holt, Elysia Taitivi, Miranda Janelle, Lily Gray, Ashley Allen, Bo Kiki Yo, Stephen Kleinard, Jem Shin, Ish the Mad, Mary the Mellow, Randy Thompson, Ali Gobert, Matt Chung, Super Desi, Wellington Marcus, D. Kessler Ray, Vincent Ellington, Boyd and Mary Bethel, Sylvester Rautau, Barbara Ruski, G. Man 42, Joseph Dewey, Felicia Toast, Chloe Dollar, Alex Miller, James Krivda, Elizabeth Christensen, Dominic Noble, Jennifer Fuss, Zone One Librarian, Andy with an I, Jessica Wright, Sean McKenzie, Sonia Nero Perdo. Lily's Hazel Eyes, Nathaniel Froughton, Alicia Stice, Mag Mag, Ferenga Toe, Transit Toronto, Shield Maiden 4444, Wendell Zabizzle, Sasha M, Spencer Brownlee, Tangy Wilson, W Randy E.D., Steven Richardson, Spooky Heather Sylvia, Drew Bach, Ulysses the Pagan, Carry the Neuro Turtle, Pissed and Twisted Garage, Huh, Zoe Kerr, Melinda Walters, Fox E, Kevin Freitag, Willow B, Beatrix Purvis, Cyber Quaker, Casual Observer, Sean Piper, Martin J. Lower, Lynn, Lisa Gretchen Badger, Meta Whisper, Jedi, Indiana Jones. Absalon is greater than Silly Christie, Odd, Just Odd. Sarah Bystem, Sarah Leslie Hutchkins, Kayliss, William Stewart, Sky Skinner, Patricia Cromptick, Becky Sparks, Blueberry Hill, Laura Demero, Sarah Lemero, Heoresis, Nathan Steele, Blue, Troy Stull, Justine, Melody Ann, Winter's Good, Verdix Kai, Leo the Boyd, Geek Filter, The Tipsy Changeling, Maeve, Zimlua Kincaid, Tony the DC Nerd, Jason Knott, Luna T, Strawberry Pup Tart, Holly Walters, Nikki Gordon, Bloomfield, Celestial Dawn, Angie Pugh, Michael Goaty, Abigail Marie, Kelly Davis, Bella Lagusi, James Hodge, Vale and Corey, Honkin' In. Mwah to all of you, I adore you all, and again, thank you all for your support.